I'm going to ask our uh, full panel to come up, Dr. Pruitt and Mr. Adcock. Dr. Adams, you want to join us as well? Dr. Elders, right there in the middle. Okay. Oh. Wherever you'd like. Well, and, you, and thank you so much for being here, and, and well done mm -hmm. in your leadership over decades uh, in the area of public health. I'm curious, though, with uh, as chaotic as things are on the political stage right now, could you comment, you said educate politicians and community <coughs> leaders, uh, easier said than done. Yes. Uh, you're friends with a, a few politicians, I hear. Yeah. One or two? Yes. Um, maybe comment on what, what's the message that really kind of pierces through uh, to their consciousness about how important, not just the issue of infant mortality, yeah. but across the board in public health. Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure, so I don't know the answer to that question. But I think the, one of the things that I know, the most important thing that politicians feel, they want to get reelected. That, that's number one. <laughs> so, well, but no, but, but the thing we need to do is we need, we have to make, it, and the people, you know, politicians are elected by people. And so we have to go out in our individual communities, educate our people, and so make them think about it all the time. And when I was working on educating politicians, I said, you know, I was trying to prevent teenage pregnancy. So I said, if you had gone down, walked down the street in Little Rock and said, well, what's the most important health problem in Arkansas? They say, teenage pregnancy. I said, I didn't know whether that was the most important problem or not. But I had everybody thinking, it was, and that's what you have to do. And that's what you have to have. That. But see, if everybody, <laughs> but then if all the people are convinced of that, then they convince the politicians, because when they talk to the politicians, the politicians know they vote. Mm -hmm. And so. It's leveraging that influence, right? Th that's right. Amen. Well, we're going to open up for some uh, audience <clears throat> questions here. We've got one specifically for Dr. Adams, but the whole team. Um, Maybe, uh, Dr. Adams, you could start. How do we marry the messages of safe sleep and breastfeeding? And there's that natural uh, kind of uh, uh, conflict between those two concepts. Well, well, that's a wonderful question, and I'm not going to answer it because we have someone here who can answer that question. But what I am going to do is help frame that question. Some of you have heard me speak about this, and uh, it's exactly what Ryan was talking about. We've got communities out there working in their own silos that are giving, quite frankly, conflicting messages on some of these issues. We've got uh, folks in the breastfeeding community telling moms to sleep with your children. We have people giving out pacifiers as part of safe sleep uh, uh, packages, which the breastfeeding community doesn't want you to do. And I would, I would say that it doesn't, we don't have to be on separate tracks. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to come together but it's hard to do that once you've already got the message out there and the billboard's up and the package is already paid for and in the mail. And so I think it, that question drives home Ryan's point from earlier about the need for us to have discussions such as this, but then to take them forward and, and really try to figure out how we get on the same page in the planning process so that we come out on the same page and promote that same message. But Ryan, thoughts about how you all were able to get over that sure. in Cincinnati? Yeah, I, I, I'm glad to see the question. I would agree wholeheartedly with what you said. I think uh, the very starting point is to stop treating each other like enemies. So uh, get in the room together, talk through things. Uh, I have made more presentations to the lactation consultants in Hamilton County than probably any other group. Uh, and uh, I'm always looking uh, to, uh, to understand where they're coming from rather than to be understood myself. So. Uh, looking for um, input, opportunities. We have changed some of the literature that we've put out based on feedback they've given us. Uh, we have edited pacifiers out of our safe sleep video uh, based on feedback that they've given us. Uh, we are um, getting ready to launch kind of phase four of our, our sleep, uh, sleep campaign. And uh, this has an image of uh, a mom, and you'll be glad to know also a dad in a separate <laughs> image, um, with uh, in bed, sleeping in bed, with a crib right next to the bed to, to sort of show that Alone doesn't have to mean lonely off yeah. in some distant corner of the house. Uh, it can be right there with mom or dad. And where are our hospitals? Who's here from a hospital or works in a hospital? Raise your hands. All right, so all these folks out there, we need to do a better job of bringing them into the fold because where does baby usually get that first pacifier? Before they even leave the hospital. We've got, we've got and, and I don't blame the hospitals for that. 
that's what the community is demanding. So it, it's, it's cyclical. Um, the culture has created this idea that something's expected. We've got to work to change the culture so that the hospitals are simply giving the moms what they want and what they demand and what, fr quite frankly, some communities say they need. But we've got to bring all these partners into the fold. Very good. Uh, for Dr. Pruitt, a question. How can single parent, non-traditional families incorporate the concepts of fathering? Non-traditional families. Um, 38% of all children in America will reach college age living with their biological parents. So traditional families are a minority. They have always been a minority. They will always be a minority. So I think the first thing we need to do is just sort of mentalize the problem and say, we're really talking about most of us here. And that's across race, that's across ethnicity, it's across economics, and I appreciate the Surgeon General sitting next to me nodding. That makes me feel really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so let's, let's cast that aside and say we're not talking about outsiders. We're talking about really our neighbors, ourselves, and our own families. So the issue about how to support a woman who appears alone um, is to ask from the beginning who her supports are. Who is going to, who can she bring to her next appointment? Who is she looking to, to help her? We also can emphasize the importance of having some fathering presence in the child's life. Is she getting help from her father, her brothers, her uncles? Children really do enjoy that kind of input. And so communities, our fr those of us who know single mothers, how often do we say, look, I got some time. I, I'm going to take a bunch of kids. X, Y, or Z, can I have some time with yours? I think it'd be fun to do it together. It really is breaking down the silos and saying, this is not really her problem to solve. It is the community's problem to solve. And again, if you keep in mind the single most important person here, which is the child, they will, they will grow to thank you for helping their mother feel like she was not alone. Dr. Pruitt, I, I actually had a question related to that. With same-sex <coughs> couples, very specifically, do you see the same chemical changes and the same cues? Does one of the, does one of the moms in a, in a two mom relationship use their child as a hood ornament? I uh, <laughs> actually, you'd be surprised. Uh, I guess that's why you're asking the question, Terry. I, I live in the largest uh, percentage community of lesbian parents in America. I live in Northampton, Massachusetts. And there are about 600 parenting couples there who are lesbians. And um, I work with many of them. And we see some of these very same good cop, bad cop, frustrating tolerance, frustrating supporting, disciplinary styles, that dimorphism, that sort of polarization seems to happen quite naturally regardless of gender. Because I think it's really more about roles than it is about X or Y chromosomes. And so um, they get into the same fights, the same struggles that heterosexual <laughs> couples do. And so to, to treat them as though they do not is to really not serve them very well. And again, the eye on the prize, their children. How do their children do? Well, their children know who to go to if they want ice cream, and <coughs> they know who to go to if you know they don't want ice cream. They figure that out very early. And so I, I think it's really important that we not think about, you know, 210 volts shouldn't go through you whenever you sort of say, we're talking about a gay or a lesbian couple here. The children, frankly, don't notice uh, and, until they're quite old, and then by then, if we've been advising the couple uh, of ways to talk about who they are, how they made these decisions, those children not only do just fine, um, actually gay and lesbian couples do a better job of co-parenting than heterosexual couples. Lessons to learn, thank you. For Mr. Adcock, um, in terms of communication, what is ineffective in reaching the demographic groups that need to hear the risks to high infant mortality? Almost everything we do uh, is, is ineffective. So uh, a couple absolute uh, no-brainers no here. Um, when you're talking to the community, never, ever, ever use an acronym for any reason, uh, regardless of how many people you think know that acronym. Uh, it's it's uh, just likely to shut people off. Similarly, jargon. So jargon that's very common in the public health community, including things like, uh, like the language around the social determinants of health. Really important con concept, really important to talk about in these kinds of settings. 
when you're out in the community, hey, where you live, work, and play affects your health. You know, it's it's that simple. Don't try to don't try to hang uh, larger vocabulary on it than than it needs to have. Um, I'd say beyond that, we have found that families are um, exceptionally receptive to having people who uh, look like them in in the messaging. So. We have gone to uh, groups of moms, groups of dads around the community, and said, hey, what do you think? We're, we've got you know, five or six different concepts we're playing around. And if only one of those concepts has an African American family in it, we're talking to African Americans, it does not matter what the sort of messaging concept is. They're like, I like that one. That one looks good to me. That looks like uh, my family. And so can't, cannot overestimate uh, the importance of that, which means you have to know your audience. You have to know if you're speaking to mom, if you're speaking to dad, if you're speaking to an Appalachian community, a Hispanic community, an African American community. And then specific to the African American community, another big, big learning of ours is this is a community that for years has been told again and again and again what is wrong with them, how sick they are, how big the disparities are. And I've seen messages that come out that sort of smash that over the head and say, you know, hey, um, you know, your babies are dying and, you know, have this really sort of dark message. It's a community that does not, until very recently, get a lot of affirmative messages. Hey, this is what a healthy African American family looks like. This is a, a family um, uh, partaking in, in uh, great activities. With our uh, <coughs> messaging that went out around spacing, um, we uh, made the choice to include a dad in the, in the imagery. And the feedback we got from families was incredible. Hey, this looks like a strong black family. That is something we don't see around mm -hmm. our community in uh, folks who are trying to, trying to sell us the latest and greatest. Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Elders, we, we took the infant mortality rate from, from 40,000, or, or not the rate, but the numbers from 40,000 down to 20,000, and you were part of that. I mean, what was effective um, in terms of getting that message out? Same question to you. Well, I, 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 I obviously don't know, but you know, I think where the, our teenage pregnancy rate went down 60 plus percent. <laughs> our, that, I think that that, and there, our technology, and our nurses, you know, really went up. And then I think we would probably reduce smoking, uh, you know, which helped a little bit. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we told mothers about, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome. You know, we started talking about that, when I think, which I think really was a helpful things. And of course, we started encouraging, and, you know, we, it was during my time. In fact, we wrote the article on back to sleep, uh, you know. So the, that was, I think, helpful. Uh, so, and then, you know, these are, you know, there were multiple things, mm -hmm. and everybody in the community got involved. And of course, we encourage prenatal care. You know, Medicaid start, you know, you know it was 100% of poverty, 130% of, but they went, you know, if you were pregnant, you know, you, you went up to, what, I don't know, almost 185%, almost 200% mm -hmm. of poverty. For pregnant women, they they dropped them off, the, you know, as soon as the baby was born. But they they tried to make sure they got early and good prenatal care. And I think all of those factors influenced it. And we began to encourage churches. You know, we have they they have all the great, the wonderful churches with a lot of old folk like me who would really like to be, you know, grandmothering and helping and getting youngsters to prenatal care and all. And I think we need to start using. Mm -hmm. and, and so in Arkansas, they had a big grandmother's uh, program, which I thought was very helpful. And you know, they, the grandmothers kind of took over. This is almost like their grandchild. They nursed them through prenatal care, but they also kept following them to make sure they went to their well baby visits and got immunizations. But I think all of those things really, you know, and I, took, I think it took all of it. There is no, to me, mm -hmm. there is no one thing right that's going to make the difference. And, and we probably <coughs> opened up, we didn't know about fathering as much as we, I learned today, but we did start s allowing the fathers to come in, you know, <laughs> boyfriends, you know, that was what we, come in for prenatal visits. You know, before, the idea of a boyfriend coming in for prenatal yeah. was just out of the question. <laughs> so, uh, so, I, so, so I think there are just a lot of things we start doing a little bit, a little bit better. Dr. Pruitt, we talked about other caregivers, but what about, what about siblings? Um, when you talk about the African-American community, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the time, dad is in jail or quite frankly not present, and it falls on grandmother, it falls on older sister, it falls on older brother. How do we message it and effectively 
utilize and empower other siblings, other children to help lower our infant mortality rate? So it's a great question, Jerry. The, the, the population, the very interesting population of, of older male siblings in father absent black families, um, there are a lot of them. They often take themselves very seriously and they take their responsibilities very seriously. We see them in pediatric emergency rooms all the time. They'll even go to a parent-teacher conference. And once we began sort of being aware of that there are these guys, and they're 11 and 12, they're teenagers, and they are um, they're receiving almost no support from the community in doing that, we, we actually shifted that around in, in, uh, at Yale and have the emergency <coughs> room and said, when you see one of these boys, you know, let's start a group for them. And so we held a group in the emergency room. And before we knew it, you know, we had 37 uh, coming. And their devotion to their younger siblings was so moving to the nurses and the child care and the pediatricians, everyone else. So once you, you know, get out of your silo, pay attention to what's actually happening in your community and support it, um, these, these young men began to say, you know, well, we, we, and we've got supports for them, we helped them, and we appreciated the job they were doing, brought their, the mothers of their siblings in, and they were, the mothers were often very proud, but they were embarrassed about it, and they said, you know, I can't provide for everybody. Here's my older boy act acting like the father. I'm embarrassed about it. We shifted that conversation, she got, began to appreciate the support. So don't make them invisible, that's the problem. Don't make them invisible, and when they show up, support them and boy will you improve the safety actually and security within that family. I'm glad it's a great point. L let me ask you, one question popped up really having more to do with uh, the issue of cultural sensitivity. You know many times when you're talking about disparities where we're talking about the African American community or uh, folks in low socioeconomic uh, standards but now we have uh, refugees and undocumented immigrants mm -hmm. who are living in our communities. Anything the, the, the panel could offer in terms of uh, specifically outreaching for that group, which clearly is uh, more difficult to find and enfranchise in, in these efforts? I'd say uh, from my perspective, um, you may have noticed I'm a white man. Uh, and so um, if you do not look like the population that you are trying to serve, which I know is uh, relevant for a whole lot of folks in this room, um, I think it's really important to um, not just listen, but l literally schedule time on your calendar for listening to folks who uh, don't look like you. Uh, I have a couple mentors in Cincinnati uh, who are African American women uh, who I go to with dumb questions and with, uh, you know, some of those meetings just start with like, hey, talk to me, tell, tell me what's going on, tell me what you're seeing, uh, and just spend an hour listening uh, to those wonderful women who generously give me that time. Um, but then also, literally, to the, the population that we are trying to serve, we um, are constantly looking for new ways to hear the community voice in our work. Uh, this past year, um, we held a, a film festival in a very, very poor community in Cincinnati. And uh, what we did is we spent uh, 12 weeks with a, a filmmaker. We went around and we found uh, nine different stories from community members. One was about the Pee Wee football team. Uh, one was a, a, about a mom who was going through pregnancy. And uh, we, we created these short films with these community members. And the entire reason we did that was to start to build some sense of community around the work we're doing in that, in that neighborhood. Uh, a lot of the films didn't have anything to do with infant mortality. It was simply a way of starting a conversation uh, that we can continue on. In, in another neighborhood, we're launching a theater project around the concept of uh, pregnancy spacing. How do you have a conversation about uh, a really tough to discuss subject, subject like uh, when you decide to have sex with somebody and what kind of uh, mm -hmm. protection you might be using during that time. Well, we thought live theater might be a great opportunity for that, so we're um, I involving the arts community in that way and bringing them in. I think anything I can do to better listen to people's who experiences who are not my own is gonna improve the, the work I'm doing. And, and I would say uh, the faith-based community is ever so important. You specifically mentioned the refugee population, um, uh, minorities, that they tend to have a higher rate of participating in a strong church community than other individuals. And we tend to leave the, the uh, faith-based community out of our discussions in funding and in, and in health care and in public health. But I think if you want to reach th those folks that are hard to reach, um, 
reach them through the faith-based community. And, and I can't second what Ryan said enough, and I'll frame it in a little bit of a different way. <clears throat> so let's say I talk to the pastor. Let's say I have everything all set up. I go into the church, and I want to give them a whole big spiel about how terrible their infant mortality rate is and why we need to address it. Well, I say, I say across the board, whether it's politics, whether it's health, whatever, you don't know what someone else's top five is. And my top five coming in there may be infant mortality, smoking, obesity, et cetera. Their top five may be, we can't pay the rent. We, we, we can't eat, and you're trying to get, yell at me for buying my kid McDonald's. So you've got to listen to them and find out what their issues are and show them that you care about their issues and then use that as an opportunity to build a relationship and bridge into what you want to talk about. So let's talk about safe housing. Let's talk about the fact that, you're com that you don't feel um, comfortable walking around in your neighborhood, and that could be contributing to your obesity. And, le and then let's move that, once we've established that, into a discussion about how that can help raise up your infant mortality rate. So maybe we don't even talk about infant mortality. Because we know if we address those other social factors and social determinants, it's going to improve our infant mortality rate. But we've got to stop going into places with an agenda. And that's hard, because the money, the funding comes with an agenda and based on certain metrics. So it is really hard. And one of the things that I talk about when I go to C CDC, go to DC, is trying to change the funding paradigm, <clears throat> the, way, the way that we empower you all financially to do the work that you do, it, it set, puts you up, sets you up so that you've got to go in that church and talk about issue, a, issue X and not listen to the community. But that's why we're continuing to enrich the rich and, and ignore the poor. Dr. Pruitt, would, uh, is it instructive or things to learn about particularly Hispanic populations which have very strong family units? Father is usually working uh, a couple of jobs and uh, Again, many of these families kind of uh, fly below the radar screen for fear of deportation or other things. And I know it's a, a bit of a, a, a political hot potato right now, but is there, is there things to be learned or research, social research that could be done to, um, to learn from particularly cultures that still are doing a good job with maintaining the family unit? Um, I was privileged to work with a research group uh, hired by the state of California to reduce <clears throat> rates of abuse and neglect in their migrant worker population. They'd spent $85 million over 20 years and hadn't changed the training of one welfare worker. And there was one brave soul who said, I have an idea and I, before I retire, I wanna, wanna try it. And so he came to us and said, you know, I want to use some of your ideas about engaging men to see if we can move this needle because nothing else has moved this needle. So we worked with that population, it was a 12 year study, and we brought the rates of abuse and neglect in that population to practically zero. Wow. And it was a remarkable, and we were, we bent over backwards to make sure we were culturally uh, sensitive and attuned. They came to us at the end of the study and said, you know, you wasted a lot of time on that stuff because yeah, our families are different. They're a little different than the African American, they're a little different than yours. But man, when you're thinking about how to make life better for your kid than you had, we're pretty much all in the same boat. And I wanna share that with you because I'm not recommending that you ignore um, cultural influences, but you don't need to be paralyzed by them either. Mm -hmm. Because the common cause that is represented in this conference is far more important than the, than the, the cultural tone that you will, you will adopt within your family. And we also found that once those uh, Hispanic or Latino or Chicano families came into the United States, by the second generation, they were looking an awful lot more like the people in their neighborhoods than they were in Puerto Rico or in Mexico. So I think it's very important. Language, incredibly important, incredibly important. And I wanted to go back to one point about uh, the migrant population, et cetera. Helping professions, which all of you are in, are not uniformly listening professions. And the biggest mistake I've seen with migrant worker and migrant populations is that you spend your time advancing your agenda, which is what they've asked you to do, without doing your homework first, which is to listen to what's on theirs. And I couldn't agree more with what Jerry said. And you're gonna waste a lot of time and money if you don't do that first. It's uncomfortable because you gotta sit there passively, <laughs> listen, make sure you get it right, repeat, is this really what you mean? Is this what your you know, top five are, mm -hmm. et cetera? And we're not always very good at that because we have all these tools we're so anxious to use. 
Keep them in your box until you know where they're going to be useful, whether you're doing metric or whether you're doing American. You won't know that. You'll bring the wrong tool for the job. We're having a number of questions pop up about um, kind of regional variations across the state. And Dr. Elders, you can certainly speak to having traveled the country during your uh, term and after how, how much uh, variation there is from, from state to state. But I don't know, Dr. Adams, did you want to speak to any of uh, more particular uh, efforts uh, department? Ooh. Well, I, I would. We get, uh, get, get questions about some of our regional pockets, for instance, Northwest Indiana. And, and I will say that there are, there are trends, there are themes and the things we need to do to address infant mortality, but an infant death is about as local as a thing as can occur. It is a, it is a very local phenomenon, and it, you heard me talk about this earlier. The causes in Adams County are very different than the causes in Allen County, are very different than the causes in, in Lake County or Marion County or Vanderburg County. And so what we really need to do is empower local innovation, local investigation, local partnerships, and that's what the theme of today's conference is. Uh, I know that I'm not supposed to say this, and this is a very unpopular thing for a health commissioner to say, state can't save you. We can't. We're not gonna, we're, we, we can't, we don't have the, the ability to do it. And when you look at Lake County, and I've been up to Lake County probably more than any other county I've been to. It's a day to get up there on a different time zone. They, they, they uh, <coughs> watch different television stations. Um, I can't craft something in Indianapolis that is going to reach the people in Lake County the way that they could craft something it is going to reach them, or the way that the Chicago market could. So partnerships across state lines. And we have Cincinnati here for the southern half, but we really need to, Art, I don't know where you are. He's probably in the back. We need to make sure we get some folks here from, uh, from Chicago next year, or Michigan, for, uh, uh, which, uh, which affects the, uh, the northeast market. But again, it's partnerships, local innovation, that are really going to drive the change and not us trying to figure out in Indianapolis what's needed in Vandenberg County and make it the same as what's needed in Allen, or make it the same as what's delivered in all these other counties. Very good. Uh, and and, and I would agree that, mm -hmm. you know, you can't... You know, the Surgeon state General state, just yeah. agreed with me. Did somebody tweet <laughs> that? <laughs> uh, last couple minutes, if we could just have everyone kind of give a last word of encouragement to, uh, to our audience and uh, words of wisdom. Dr. Elders. Uh, well, I th what I think you're doing, I, you've had a wonderful conference and a lot of wonderful speakers and you've gotten a lot of good information. But don't take the information that you got here, keep it in your notebook, mm -hmm. and don't ever pull it out to use it. Go home and start finding uh, partners or some partners you'd like to develop. And you know, it doesn't have to be, a, if it's a big grandiose project that's failed already but some little project. You know, even if you make a difference with one, you never know what that one can do to make a difference throughout their, their community. So I, I encourage you to each find out the one thing that you've learned that you want to make a difference in and that you want to change and just go get started and work on that one thing. And I think you'll be surprised at the difference, at the difference that you as one individual can make. Dr. Pruitt? Uh, she just inspired, uh, I, I threw out what I was going to say, and I, I, because of, I was inspired by what she said. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite gospel tunes growing up was This Little Light of Mine. And I think that, and the reason I love it is because there are many lights in this audience um, that will leave today, uh, and I hope illuminated by some information and by something that you could do better at. And I'm pretty sure that most of us could probably do a better job at making the men that affect the lives of our children, one way or the other, feel a little more welcome in the work that we do. And you can challenge your institutions, you can inventory father friendliness in your own settings, call people to, not judgment, but to awareness about this and say, how are we doing? And we could do better. There are a number of interesting little inventories. One's called the Organizational Self-Assessment. The other one is with NFI, the National Father Inst Institute, as a father friendliness. <coughs> if you take one of those inventories, you will change your little light mm. is going to become a chandelier. And I, I think that's more grandiose than that. You don't need today. Good luck with doing that. Thank you.
Awesome. Okay, Cock. Uh, so I, I said this is really hard work, but it is uh, eminently doable work. But everyone in this room has uh, the power <laughs> to do this, and I think yeah, I frequently have conversations with folks who want to say, yeah, but you know, yeah, but you haven't met the partners I'm trying to work with. Trust me. I have. There's, you know, there's, there's crazy in Cincinnati too. I promise. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, but we're in a rural community. Yeah, but we can't get uh, an appointment with the guy we're trying to get an appointment with. Um, what this takes more than anything else is vision and uh, being willing to um, ask bold questions of people who have uh, the power to make decisions. I have very little power myself, um, but I'm uh, unafraid to go to the doors of people who do have power and say, hey. Here's what I'm working on. I think it's important. I think you would think it's important. Uh, let, let's do something together. And um, it, you know, we're just getting started in Cincinnati. I'm really excited to learn uh, about all the work, the work that's happening in Indiana today and to do the same thing you guys are doing, take notes back home to Cincinnati and, and uh, do some good stuff. Well, I'll be really brief. Uh, I want to second what Dr. Elder said, but I, I want to give you all a specific action item. I want everyone in this room to uh, think of one bit of information, one presentation from today and a group that you can take this information back home to. And specifically, go there with the intention of saying, I'm going to tell you, show, redo this presentation. I'm going to share this information with you, with this particular group in your community, and try to change the way that they think about infant mortality. The other quick point I will make is, uh, Ryan, what does the back of my card say? A state that works. This is the health commissioner's card. It doesn't say the healthiest state. It doesn't say the state that's striving to lower infant mortality. It says a state that works. You need to engage your business community in this discussion and show them how addressing the infant mortality rate will affect overall health throughout the community and will affect their economic bottom line so that you can get funding for these projects so that you can engage the decision makers in this process. And I, with that, I want to say thank you to Dr. Werner for being a great moderator. What a wonderful panel. How about a round of applause for yes. all the speakers?